This drawing is so special. Archimedes wished for this drawing to be on his tombstone. So what do I have here? Just in the outer form, I have a cylinder. Can you see the cylinder? The cylinder isn't any random cylinder. This cylinder has to fit a sphere inside it. The sphere has the same height as the cylinder and the same diameter. Now imagine that the sphere gets removed. And then what do we have inside the cylinder? We have a double cone. So this big X, what you're really seeing is a double cone. I could go over here and just draw a smaller picture of what a double cone might look like. The floor of the cone is exactly the same as the floor of the cylinder, and the top of this double cone is the same as well. And let's just be clear here if this makes sense. If instead of a double cone, see if you can follow this, instead of a double cone, if I just had a normal cone and the base was here and the peak of the cone was at the top of the cylinder, so if I drew a cone like this, that, would, that cone would have one-third the volume of the cylinder that it fits into. What about the double cone? Well, the double cone, if I just take this much of it from here to here, just the bottom half of the double cone, the volume of that would be half the normal cone that comes to here, but there are two of them. So what am I saying? The volume of the double cone is exactly equal to one-third the volume of the cylinder. What Archimedes didn't know and what he's trying to figure out is what is the volume of the sphere in terms of the cylinder? Maybe the volume of the sphere would be half of the cylinder that it fits into, or maybe it would be three quarters or some other fraction thereof, and that's what he's trying to figure out, right? But certainly what he knew and what many people knew before him was the volume of a cone is one third of the cylinder that it fits into, and so he's gonna use that information. Now what about this green thing? Is it clear what that is? And what I've tried to draw here, and it's difficult, is this is a plane cutting through the cylinder parallel to the floor or the top of the cylinder. It's cutting through the cylinder, not directly through the middle. Point M is the exact center of the sphere and the center of the cylinder, center of the cone, it's all of that. But this this plane is cutting through higher up than the, than the middle of all of that. So if I had a stick going through the cylinder that went through the center of the cylinder, right down through point M, et cetera, that stick intersects plane P at this pink point right here. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine when that plane cuts through, it cuts through everything. It's cutting through in creating circles, in fact, three circles. One of the circles that it creates is the circle of the cylinder itself. Another circle is the circle of the sphere that the plane cuts through. Right? Can you picture this? If I take a ball and I cut a plane through it and I'm not going through the center of the ball and I go like close to the top even, right, and I slice it off like that, and I look what's left there, I'm gonna have a circular cut through it, right? And it would be the same with the cone. If I cut at an angle with the cone, by the way, I'd get an ellipse, but I'm not doing that, it's horizontal. So I'm gonna get three circles. And now, my second attempt at doing something really scary today, um, I am gonna draw the three circles, which in the drawing actually appear as ellipses. Does that make sense? They will be circular cuts that the plane creates, but when I draw it, just like this, this is supposed to be a circular top, but because my view is just raised up a little bit, they appear as ellipses, it's in perspective. And so this is a line just drawn from O straight out to the edge of the cylinder. And it intersects each of the circles at, at point A, at point B, and that's the edge, that's where it intersects with the yellow circle, which is a circle created by the sphere. And then we have C. 
And then the last thing I'm going to do is connect a line straight down from O to M. What is the difference between this drawing and what this will become? This drawing is me looking, I'm raised up a little bit, kind of looking down a little bit at the cylinder. This is an orthogonal projection, so I'm really looking at it perpendicularly and you could almost imagine infinitely far away, but zoomed in. And so now the plane just appears, it's on edge, it just appears as a line, as do all the circles. So if I imagine this, can you imagine this in motion? You're coming down like this and all the circles rotate up like this until they all fall upon one another, right? So where is right here, where is this orange circle? That orange circle would just be going from here to here on edge. Where is the yellow circle? Well, the yellow circle is going from the edge of the sphere here all the way to here. And then the blue circle goes from here to there. So I'm going to label now all the points that I have from the first drawing. R1 is the radius of the circle that was created when the plane cut through the cone. R2 is the radius of the circle that was created when the plane cut through the sphere. R3 is the radius of the circle created when the plane cut through the cylinder. What is R1 equal to? Well, it's OA. What's the radius of the sphere? It's OB. Again, the radius of the circle, the cross-sectional circle created when the plane cut through the sphere. The cylinder's circle is OC. What is MB equal to? Well, MB is the radius of the whole sphere. So MB is the radius of the whole original sphere. And if I imagine it like a windshield wiper coming down, it's also the radius of the cylinder. And in particular, it's the radius of the blue circle. Because wherever the plane cuts through the cylinder, the blue circle is not going to change. It's, it's that size. It's the size of the top and the bottom of the cylinder as well. So what did I just say? MB is also equal to the radius of the blue circle. What else do we see that's going to be helpful? What about this? What is OM equal to? What is that equal to? Well, that's equal to OA. Why? Because this is a square, right? Because the height, this is the outline of the cylinder seen from the side. Right? And the diameter is equal to the height. And if that's true, then we know this is going to be a 45, 45, 90 triangle. Therefore, this side has to be equal to this. So OM is also equal to OA. And now we can put all of this together. Why? Because guess what I know? Here's a right triangle. So we have triangle O. M, B is right, it's a right triangle. And if it's a right triangle, what do we know? We can then use the Pythagorean theorem. And that's what I will do now with that. Can you picture this in movement? What's going to happen if that plane was cutting through higher up? How do these circles change? Can you picture that? If the plane is cutting through higher up, right, the higher up that I cut it, this orange circle that results from cutting the cone gets bigger and bigger. And the yellow circle from cutting the sphere gets smaller and smaller. If I, go, if I cut through high enough, actually the yellow circle from the sphere will be smaller than the orange circle from the cone. The blue circle will always be the same, right? So no matter where you've cut it, 
this relationship will still be true. And guess what I'm going to do now? I can add pi out in front of each of these. And now what is this? This is an interesting relationship, isn't it? It turns out that the blue circle, the area, isn't that the formula for the area of the blue circle? That was equal to the area of the yellow circle plus the area of the red circle. Interesting, no matter where I'm cutting it, the area of the red circle plus the area of the yellow circle will equal the area of the blue circle, no matter where. Now that was nice. And Archimedes does take these steps of using some calculus concepts. In fact, some people would say he took the first steps of calculus. And so he's, a saying, he's saying now that what I'm going to do is I'm going to imagine that the cone has now been sliced into these infinitely many and infinitely thin slices. Can you see it? So the bottom slicing of the, of the cone is a disc this big, and above that's another one a little bit smaller. And so the cone ends up being a stack of increasingly small discs, circular discs, smaller and smaller and smaller, and now they start getting bigger. The sphere also is a collection of these disks. Wherever you are at a given slicing, at a given cross section, it's always going to be true, just like the circles, the area of the red circle plus the area of the yellow equals the area of the blue. It's also going to be true if you do it three dimensionally. And so in the end, through that logic that I just summarized, not in all the details perhaps I could have or should have done, he says this. The volume of the cylinder is going to equal the volume of the sphere plus volume of the cone. And if we consider the cylinder to be the whole, how much is the cone of the whole? Well, we know that the cone is one third of the whole. And if the volume of the whole cylinder is equal to the cone plus the sphere, what must the sphere be? Two thirds of the cylinder. So in the end, the ratio, triple ratio of the cone to the sphere to the cylinder is one to two to three. And so what does this tell us with the triple ratio? Well, if I just want to consider, as we knew before, the cone to the cylinder, is going to be one to three. We already knew that. What about the sphere to the cone? Well, the sphere to the cone is one to two. So interestingly, the sphere was exactly twice as big as the cone. And really, perhaps most importantly, what's the relationship of the sphere to the cylinder? It's two thirds, which again says that the volume of a sphere that fits inside of a cylinder is going to be such that the sphere is two-thirds as much as the cylinder. And there we are.